go. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to our midweek musings once again this week. Uh, we have kicked off a new series in our uh, worship times. Uh, we are on a mission from God together. That's our uh, series that we are in the middle of uh, now, kind of looking at the early part of Jesus' uh, mission uh, and his, his life and work and ministry in Galilee and starting toward Judea. Um, we, we start to see what it means to be engaged in God's mission, uh, and we hear a call on ourselves as well uh, to be engaged in that mission alongside Jesus. This week, we're going to be looking at um, uh, the story of Jesus calling three of his disciples uh, and inviting them into mission along with him, um, and so we're going to be talking about our role with that as well. Steve is pulling up the uh, the reading for the day, and I'll go ahead and read it, and we'll pray and begin our conversation. So Jesus calls the first disciples in Luke chapter 5. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray. Inviting God, we thank you for calling us out of mindlessness toward mindfulness, that we would be aware of your presence from moment to moment, always beckoning us outside of ourselves calling us to stand up from our curved inwardness so that we can respond to the needs of our neighbors around us. Send us out as your people into the world that we might lift others to new life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. All right, so what stands out and what questions come up? Uh, it's, a, it's a miracle story. It's a call story. It mirrors some of the prophetic calls. What, what, what do you see here? What's happening? Well, just a general comment. I would say that when we're reading these stories, uh, we should be uh, reminded that we can include, or Luke or the writer of this gospel can't include all the details. So when all of a sudden they pull up to shore and leave everything and follow, uh, there, it, it may not have happened in that time sequence. I'm guessing that there were some uh, other events that happened and some other goodbyes and some other whatevers, you know, but I think not to, to dwell on that because I think that would be to uh, miss the center here, but I think we should be careful that we don't try to assume that all the details are there and it happened just as it is written. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's a great way to introduce it because what I was, I, I was wondering myself um, how many of the detail or to what degree of the details that are included are we to really hang a hat on them? Yeah. What I mean by that is um, there are two interactions early on. Um, the first interaction Jesus has with Peter, he asked him to put the boats out a little bit. Um, the second interaction, he tells him to go out and fish in the deep water. And I, again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an English major, so those little details mean a lot to me, but I don't know to what degree something like that might be intended. Uh, maybe yeah. it was kind of written that way, but um, to me, it's interesting to, to hear the ask 
Peter responds positively, and maybe then since he responds positively, um, Jesus can just move on to tell him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the openness of Peter, I think, is important there. You know, and, and this is this is a, a point with with reading the Bible, you know, and it, you can get down into the weeds, right, of like um, what actually happened, what didn't actually happen, because, you know, this is Luke setting down an orderly account, as he says, based on, you know, eyewitness testimony, based on, you know, traditions that have been passed down. We, we in biblical scholarship think that he probably was operating with some knowledge of the Gospel of Mark, which was most certainly written before this. And so that informs it a little bit. Um, he also shares this tradition with John, except for John tells this story after the resurrection. And so like, there's a, a mixing of traditions. So then when we drill down into it, we can start to ask the question, what is Luke or the author of any gospel? What are they trying to say about Jesus? And what are they trying to say about our response to Jesus, right? And I think that's where this story takes on um, meaning and, and really puts muscle and flesh onto the bones here. I lift up uh, Jesus as a recruiter. Um, when he was going out and looking for his team that he was putting together, once again, he, he, uh, he relies on, on uh, people with no experience, uh, very little education, um, confused, uh, afraid, uncertain of what's coming. And yet, um, that's that's the makeup of his team, and it's simply you know follow me. So I think it's to say uh, it's on the job training here. We're going to show you what you need to do, and I'm going to equip you with all the resources and skills and tools that you need. And I think the same applies today. Yeah, and for me that that um, I read this passage, and I come away wondering. Is this mostly a passage about Jesus, or is it mostly a passage about Peter? Oh. Because Jesus really does very simple things here. Um, he asks, he tells, he um, encourages them not to be afraid. Um, but the more nuanced action in this passage is from Peter and his partners. Mm which I, I think is an interesting, um, I mean, Jesus certainly is, you know, the principal character here, but um, he, in some ways he's not the character who's driving the action. Sure. Yeah, so, so what does it tell us about like Peter's faithful response and the response of the sons of Zebedee? Does it contrast with any other responses we've seen so far in the Bible or in, in, in Luke? Um, what For do you me, think? It's quite consistent with what I read about Peter all the way through the Gospels. There's a, a just a, a, a fireball of certainty that turns into uncertainty, <laughs> you know. And so the question about pushing out to deeper water, and he says, "Well, <laughs> all right, I will." I think it's a respectful response, but with low expectations or little or no expectation. All right, I'm going to do it because you asked me. If someone else would have, I probably wouldn't do it, but because you asked me, I'm gonna go out into deeper water and I just wanna show you that uh, what we experienced during the day and the night is the same thing. And so the surprise is there, Peter, like you walking on water um, will come later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I also think Peter Peter's response is interesting because it I think Luke is trying to tell us something about like more generally about faithfully responding to the call. So we, uh, Peter in particular has his, you know, <laughs> flair to him, I guess. But, uh, uh, you know, what he, what he does is interesting. He, he kind of echoes what Mary did early in the gospel, right? This is where Luke, as a really masterful storyteller, comes out because there is like this willingness in, in, in Peter to just say, absolutely, yeah. Like I, he, he recognizes his lowly state, which is exactly what Mary does, right? Like, why would you come to me, a lowly servant, sort of a thing. Uh, recognizes his lowly state, but still sees within him something um, redeemable, something worth uh, being called, right? And so he does respond affirmatively to Jesus. This is quite, you know, contrasted uh, quite a lot with the responses of the people in uh, Capernaum, uh, the people more specifically in Nazareth in chapter four, who when Jesus uh, talked about this message and going out into the world, 
uh, they they try to throw him off a cliff, right? And so like you have this unfaithful response this, uh, that doesn't obey Jesus. And then you have this faithful response like Peter, where you recognize you know who you are in relation which also sorry i'm my brain is kind of shooting off here it also reminds me of you know the this the call story of the prophet isaiah right when the prophet isaiah was approached by the angels and by uh god being told he needed to go give this message uh the prophet's first response is um, but I am a man of unclean lips right basically saying i am i'm broken i am sinful like i am not worthy of this work uh and then he receives sort of the um burning away of his of his sinful nature um it's just it's just interesting luke is luke is a good storyteller he's saying like this is this is like the prophets right what is happening here is like something that you who are reading this understand this is like the prophets it's like mary it's not like those people at nazareth yeah you know when peter falls on his knees and calls himself sinful. I mean, he, he understands his relationship or he elevates Jesus far above himself. And yet that doesn't deter the call. I mean, I don't think Jesus even addresses his sinful nature. He simply says, you're just one of anybody. Uh, you're all going to be in that same boat, but that's who I've come to call, sinners and tax collectors. Uh, and all the way, sinner. Hmm. Yeah, and and I'm... I'm left wondering, the question I have in this passage is, um, was it something about Peter or was it something about Jesus? Mm. Um, I mean, was it something that, that Jesus saw in Peter or was it simply that Jesus chose Peter? Mm. Uh, you know, because I, I, I think um, it's tempting for us to say, well, I can't imagine Jesus could see in me what Jesus saw in Peter. Yeah. Um, you know, that these larger than life characters in scripture um, are not me. Mm. Um, so I, I, I come away from this story thinking, yeah, Peter's just who he is. Um, the big thing is that Jesus is who he is. Yeah. yeah. So roll it forward here. What is, I mean, how does that, uh, how does this reach out to a confirmation student or to a senior citizen or somebody else in our congregation here? I mean, can we say you have a calling also? I mean, that's our Lutheran tradition is to say we are all called here. Mm -hmm. I don't think many people believe that though. Mm -hmm. I think they still hold on to pastors are called and deacons are called, but I'm, uh, I just show up and I, I listen to the people that are called. And I think that we've missed out on trying to put the vocation of called uh, into everyday life. I wish we had a stronger stand there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's, um, I'm glad you pointed out that that's our failure, not theirs. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Right, and it's it's a hard conversation to have. It's it's one that we discussed uh, a few weeks ago in confirmation a bit, um, and the challenge that when you know we we task the guides, uh, we, we have lay members who who lead small groups, and we task these guides to, with um, sort of leading this conversation around calling and everything, and um, the challenge is always like helping people to see that it being called into ministry or mission doesn't mean that you have to have a job like a, a, a formal job that falls right. in in this right like you don't you, anything from pastor to like working as a not in for a nonprofit or being a teacher that like somebody in the financial sector could actually within the financial sector say um live out their vocation their calling to be a disciple right uh, someone within, you know, the service industry could do the same. Someone who's a plumber could do the same, right? It, 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 you can live out this vocation through many different vocations, right? Through many different careers or jobs. And you also live it out just in your relationships, in your call to be a faithful husband or wife, right? Your call to be a faithful friend or son or daughter or pet owner or whatever, right? Like that, you are called to remind our care team of that. You know, I've, done, I've said, you know, you can go out and say, you know, I'm just going to make a visit on someone. 
But I said, what if you go out in Jesus' name and call on someone? And uh, to me, then that takes on vocation and calling. It isn't just you acting on something instinctive here. It's that you have a calling to call on someone else who is in need of what you can bring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's really important in all the call stories in scripture. I think it's very important to understand that they are descriptive and not prescriptive. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that this is a call story that describes how Peter, James, and John were called um, into being disciples. Yeah. Um, it, it's not a story that prescribes how we are to be called. Um, I mean, Peter, James, John, they left their profession to follow Jesus. Mm. It may be that we are called to further invest ourselves in our profession to follow Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Paul, you know, um, Paul having a uh, born again experience is descriptive, not prescriptive. Yeah. Mm. That's how it happened for Paul. It doesn't mean that that's how it must happen for us. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's the thing is, is uh, a call from Christ, we believe, doesn't simply elevate the folks who, you know, are called into formal ministry in any way, right? What it does is it elevates all of our jobs, right? All of our relationships and vocations to that level of pastoral ministry or missionary ministry or whatever. It's that in each of these areas, we are considered uh, disciples called to holy work. I think that's a good place to stop. I like the idea of elevating the job instead of elevating the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We will see you on Sunday. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye.